So together, we're going to discuss the aspects of a successful venture fund pitch deck and what are the important nuances and details to consider as you build this critical tool in your fundraising toolkit. But before we go into the discussion, I'd like to briefly speak about the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and the incredible work they do, as well as IIEBC. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, it's an incredible nonprofit um, located in San Francisco at 505 Howard in a wonderful space. And through their space and their online um, offerings, they have served over 75,000 entrepreneurs since their founding. And they have served over 3,000 entrepreneurs directly through their Milestone Makers and Milestone Circles program. And those entrepreneurs have gone on to raise over 880 million in venture capital. So recognizing the critical role that capital plays in supporting entrepreneurs, the center has doubled down on its focus on the venture capital space and specifically supporting emerging venture fund managers. And the center has already done a lot in this area and will continue to do a lot of programming supporting emerging managers over the next several years. So please stay tuned. I hope that this is um, the beginning of your relationship with the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center or the continuation if you've already been involved. We are also excited to partner with IIE.VC for this event. IIE.VC, in alliance with the U.S. Treasury Department and various private sector foundations, including J.P. Morgan Chase's philanthropic arm, is dedicated to accelerating inclusivity in the U.S. venture capital industry. And as part of IIE.VC's commitment, they aim to support diverse emerging fund managers. So I've invited Cooper today um, to share a little bit more about IIE.VC with you all before we start our panel because they're doing a ton of work. So Cooper, I'm going to ask you to share more about what you all are doing. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, we're excited about this work. We are in a mission at IIE.VC to help emerging diverse fund managers expand assets under management by an additional $6 billion by 2025. And we all know how difficult it is to raise capital in any market, but especially during this time. And fortunately, the federal government is backing states to invest in venture funds in the coming years to the tune of $3 billion. And so our task at IIE is to ensure that diverse fund managers are aware that this funding is available and that they successfully navigate these programs and respond to RFPs. And so we're extremely excited to partner with organizations like the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center to get the word out and to also provide technical assistance to fund managers. We have quite a few exciting programs coming up and initiatives. We're going to be announcing um, a grant program this month to help fund managers cover some of their costs associated with applying for SSBCI funding, um, among, another, uh, among many other initiatives coming up in 2024. So if you want additional information about IIE.VC, if you want to learn more about the State Small Business Credit Initiative, um, SSBCI, and the work that we're doing across the country, then please visit our website, IIE.BC. That's again, IIE.BC. You can email me, Cooper, C-O-O-P-E-R, at IIE.BC, or follow us on LinkedIn. And we're excited to be with you today. Feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you. And if you have further questions for Cooper or about the initiative, um, he'll stick around until the end of the event, and we can ask um, anything that you have. There's, it's a really robust program. I also want to call out for um, those of you who have not yet the incredible Nicola Corzine. She is the executive director of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. She's with us um, participating in the session today. Nicola is a leader in the innovation ecosystem. I'm honored to get to work with her and have known Nicola since the center formally opened its doors. I think it was eight years ago, Nicola. Crazily, um, eight and a half years now. Isn't that amazing? Just so much time flying. <laughs> incredible. So thank you, Nicola, for being here. And Nicola is a wonderful resource um, 
for anyone interested in learning more about the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. Okay, well, thank you all. Um, I'm just gonna go through the agenda for this morning. Um, we are going to have a panel discussion um, until the top of the hour, and then we're going to do breakout sessions for 20 minutes. That's your opportunity to ask questions that you may have about your specific pitch deck, how to approach things, questions that may come up during the panel. You'll spend 20 minutes. Each of our speakers will be moderating a breakout room. And then we'll come back together to share out key insights if you have a question you'd like to bring to the group, and then we'll conclude. Does that sound good? Okay, great. Um, so I'd like to start with introductions. Just a quick minute for our speakers to share with you all who they are. Sarah, please kick us off. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Really excited for our discussion today. Uh, my name is Sarah Zolkowski. I'm a co-founder and managing partner of Recast Capital. Recast Capital is a platform that is both investing in and supporting emerging managers in venture with a specific focus on more diverse partnerships. Also a proud IIE.VC partner as well um, alongside NASDAQ. So happy to be here. Um, the Really our platform today, the core is a fund to fund strategy investing in emerging managers in venture. We define that as those raising institutional funds one, two, or three US based and US focused. In support of our fund investment strategy, we do offer two GP facing programs as a way to support more of the community than just those that we can invest in. First of which being a virtual tuition free educational program for emerging managers in venture that's been running since 2020 we've since supported 96 funds through that program. Uh, the second of which is a uh, philanthropic initiative providing operating capital to women led and non binary led emerging fund managers. Um, our goal is to support 90 new women-led and non-binary-led firms over the next three years. Uh, we kicked off that program this year, so proud to see the progress on that side of the house too. Um, as far as my personal background goes, before launching Recast, uh, I worked for Greenspring Associates, now Stepstone Group, where I spent the majority of my time on the fund side of the house. Uh, before that, was a principal at CNF Investments, was a family office in the DC area. Uh, and then before that, actually an engineer at a venture-backed startup for about eight years. So sat in a variety of seats around the entrepreneurial table. Um, so excited to share my insights with you all today from that vantage point. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Sarah. And Ching, you're up next. Hey, everybody. My name is Ching, Ching Wu. I'm coming to you from San Francisco, the Bay Area to be exact. Um, I have been in venture for 23 years, which is a really long time. And in that 23 years, 10 of those years were spent raising money. So I have raised um, over a billion dollars for two firms, uh, Canvas Ventures, which is a spin out of Morgan Thaler Ventures and 137 Ventures. And so the, the funds that I've raised were broadly speaking in technology and the sizes range from as small as 175 million to 350 million. In that time, the over a billion dollar um, number actually consists of about four flagship funds, an opportunity fund, and a, a slew of SPVs, special purpose vehicles for co-investments. And about three weeks ago, so this is new, just three weeks ago, I posted on my LinkedIn that I've resigned for 137. I don't want to work full-time anymore because I reached a giant birthday milestone. And that just set off a switch on my brain to say, it's time to think about your third act. And Jessica reached out. She saw my LinkedIn and said, why don't you speak on this panel? And so here I am, um, and I hope I'm useful to you. Thank you, Ching. I have no doubt you will be. Um, Katie, um, share with us your background. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Jessica, yeah, thanks so much for having me today. Uh, Ching, Sarah, it's great to be here with you as well. And obviously, a huge thank you to everyone in the audience for joining today and uh, spending the next hour and call it 17 minutes with us. Um, my name is Katie Roby and after spending over a decade in the industry, both in-house on the GP side and venture and private equity, and then on the allocator side with a family office, uh, I founded and now currently run Sound Beach Advisory, a boutique consultancy that works with smaller and emerging private fund managers to provide strategic guidance and operational support on developing and implementing successful IR programs. Uh, so what that means is, you know, we work with managers on everything that needs to happen in advance of and behind the scenes of a fundraise, 
as well as in between fundraising cycles. Um, just really helping GPs create consistent quality engagement and touch points with their investor base and just allow them to present the best version of themselves while focusing on investing. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Jessica. Thanks. And if you all have questions during our discussion, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll try to get to them. We're going to start out by talking about what is the goal of a pitch deck? So very high level, what is the goal of the pitch deck? And then if you all could also touch on do managers need multiple versions of a pitch deck? And what are the main sections of a pitch deck? Sarah, um, I'd love to start with you. What is the goal of a pitch deck? What should managers keep in mind? And what are those critical sections? Sure. Um, so at a high level, the goal of your pitch deck is, of course, to tell the story of the fund that you're raising. Uh, that includes uh, critical pieces of the story, such as the investment thesis, um, the market in which you're operating, but also, I think, and in, in probably most importantly, who you are or who the team is that's leading that effort and why is it that you all are the right team to be pursuing that. Um, in a, the emerging manager space is a noisy one. And so finding ways to really stand out and be that signal in the noise is really what I think the purpose of that pitch deck is. Thanks, Katie. What would you add? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with what Sarah said. It's really, I think the pitch deck is going to be the first piece of tangible collateral that a potential investor might come across. And so it really needs to kind of whet their appetite for continued dialogue. It's, um, you know, assuming they've been intro to you through, uh, you know, a verifiable source, it's just really something that they can take and digest and merit if your opportunity is worth, you know, further diligence or conversation. And Ching, I think you have a good perspective as well on multiple versions. How should folks think about if they should have multiple versions? Is that the right approach? Oh, Ching, you're on mute. So I've raised for early stage tech as well as growth stage tech funds. And the just to parrot what you know Sarah and Katie just said, you know, it's your, your pitch deck is really just to entice people's um, curiosity to, to ask for more. That you want to put them through the funnel. So in my mind, the number one reason for a pitch deck is to get them to the next step in your funnel, whether it's to get you know, the data room access, whether it's to meet more of the team, whether it's to dive deeper into case studies, whatever that is to, to you and your funnel, it's all specific to your fund. Um, so in those, in the, the years where I've raised money for these uh, several funds, I have found that different iterations or different versions of a deck is very useful because depending on where your um, LP is coming from, meaning if it's a brand new first time LP, you've never met them before, they don't know a thing about you, then you want a, a lighter intro deck that just sets the stage for, for who you are, why you're different, who's your team, et cetera. But if they, were, they came into a very warm introduction, let's say another LP introduced them to you and that LP already talked you up and you know they're real, then I would start with a meteor deck, a deck that has more performance information, more case studies. Um, and so it all depends on the situation that you find yourselves in. Well, each of you all talked about the importance of team, and we're going to talk about the construction of the all-important team slide now. I have a a uh, very bare bones example to share. And what I'd like to ask for you all to do is we'll look together at this example. And what I would like to ask, and I put myself on here and then an AI generated image, um, not to use anyone's private information. Um, what I would like to ask for you all to do is this is kind of a super basic team slide. You have images, years of investment experience combined, and then how long they've invested together. What kind of information would you add to this? What's helpful to share? Should we expect to see um, lots of logos? What, what do you all think is important? And Katie, I'd love for you to start off. Like, how would you edit this slide? Yeah, yeah. I think this is, you know, obviously a great template. Um, and, you know, there's definitely room for this towards the beginning of a pitch deck. And I would imagine you know, later on, there would be room for a more detailed biography that's, you know, got more, um, I guess, more background on your experience. But but this really is just to establish credibility. So, you know, 
who you are, high level, what you've done, what your past experience is, and if there's any, you know, big name companies or, or logos to put, then those should certainly be front and center that will help you establish credibility. Um, you know, to the extent that you and your partner have worked together in the past, I think you certainly want to find a way to play that up on this slide in terms of, you know, common prior work experience or, or say, if not for the same company, maybe perhaps you've sat on boards together or done deals together, but what is it that brought you and your partner or team members together? And, and what is it that's going to, you know, inspire LPs to make a vote of confidence that, you know, you are the right team to be pursuing this particular thesis? I saw a question from, I think it was Antonio. Feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask your question. No, I, I accidentally toggled it. I apologize. Oh, well, come up. <laughs> welcome to come up with a question if you have one. Um, Sarah, Katie, anything else to add on I, this team slide? I, I, okay. I, I, I had a question. A, a, a common one is kind of differentiation between the GPs if you're not a solo GP. So uh, the best way to kind of articulate individual superpowers and or synergies that you guys are saying. I think that's a great point. Um, I think it's a, a really wonderful thing to be able to highlight amongst a partnership is uh, not only how your backgrounds are complementary, but also how your quote unquote role on the team is, you know, we all know, uh, starting a fund is, is very much starting your own little startup, if you will. So on, in one hand, everyone's taking out the trash, everyone's doing everything. But I think from a functional area standpoint, very often you see teams of GPs focus on different areas. Um, and so highlighting that in terms of, you know, this is their a uh, person who's really focused on operations, they tend to do the management of the outsourced fund administrator, uh, HR function, if you happen to have junior staff, so forth. And then another maybe more focused on kind of the, the platform player or your founder support programs or whatever other special sauce you may have. Of course, the entire team's focused on investment due diligence and sourcing and whatnot. But um, if you can highlight where folks are spending the majority of their time or how you divide and conquer, I think that's a really nice thing to be able to do. Um, circling back to the slide itself, you know, if this is the, assuming this is early in your pitch and you're trying to really grab people, the idea is to showcase why you're the right ones to be operating within this strategy, right? And so you would want to be focusing parts of your, focusing on the parts of your backbone that are most relevant here. So if you have a track record that's quite strong, that's relevant for the investment area, having your, uh, an overall kind of track record return or multiple available can be a very compelling thing. Um, that, or if you are coming from the operating side, if you have been a high level executive at a company that maybe some may know, or even those that don't know uh, with a quick description of what that was, just to really lean into the fact that, you know, this is the expertise you're bringing to the table and it's relevant for what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I have two quick points on, on this slide, and then actually one of them is just the overall deck itself. I, I tend to like to start a deck with just words, a one sentence to say, this firm does X, unlike traditional you know, companies, we do blah differently. So because some, some of the feedback I've gotten from LPs, which it's so frustrating for them, and I don't blame them, is that we people tell the scenic route story and you know they go to this background blah 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 and then at at the end of like three slides the lp is still sitting there going what do you do you know i just yeah. heard about the team i just heard about you know combined years of experience what do you do so yeah. give me one sentence at the very top of your deck we are this kind of fun unlike others we do this or we do this differently how like what's your secret sauce so that's a one sentence topper the uh, team slide itself, I have a pet peeve. I don't like that statement of this team has a combined 25 years of blah, blah, blah. That doesn't say anything to me. And it almost feels like you're you're looking for a filler. Um, but to, to, to you know, agree with what Katie and Sarah said, very importantly, what is your, you know, when you write a deck, you say, what are the three things that I want an LP to work, walk away with? So if it's your domain expertise, that should go up at the team mm -hmm. slide. Um, and then I guess I have a third point. And the third point is how you deliver the team slide is so important, right? So every deck, every LP will keep every deck you've ever sent them. They will archive it. They will compare it to your iterations to make sure you're not, you know, 
exaggerating or changing your tune. Uh, but also very importantly, and this is a little bit of a tangent, is how you deliver the slides, right? So the team slide to me is such a softball for you to, to not get out of the park. Talk about how you love the people you work with, how you've, you know, how you've worked with them for years and how you complement each other. So more than just a text on the slide is how you deliver it and your enthusiasm. That's a great point. Yeah. And 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 Shane, just to like piggyback off that, I think another call it really important point to make is that just because team happens to be the first topic that we're discussing in this agenda, um, you know, maybe it's a point for discussion where it, you know, is that always what you need to lead with, you know, especially for emerging managers where, you know, the LPs might not know you as who you are, but you need to really almost define your thesis and what you're trying to build or do first, perhaps before you introduce yourself. Because I have seen a lot of decks where it's a little like the second or third slide where, you know, the founder's there and they say, you know, I went to like XYZ college and business school. And you're like, okay, well, great. So what, you know, like, what are you actually trying to to, to do here? And it kind of, you know, maybe people have different opinions about that, but I, I prefer to almost see a little bit more detail on the team later on in the deck after they've, you know, presented a, a call it problem that they're trying to solve and then go into like, why we're the right people to try and address it. Mm -hmm. I, it's so this is such an interesting, Jessica's probably like, you guys move on. We have lots no, of- No, I, no, but I feel like this is such an interesting part of the conversation because you've got three of us here on the panel. And I think we all have like slightly different preferences of what we like want to see and know that that's okay. So there is not one right answer to all of this. I think that's like a really important right. thing to underscore. Um, but what is incredibly important is that you're touching on the right parts of the story in an order in which is makes the most sense for you and what it is you're trying to convey. So, you know, for those that may be more known entities or, or brands that people understand, or there's a different approach than perhaps um, maybe a net new relationship with someone who's not really familiar with you, your strategy, or your relevant expertise. To circle back to Ching's point, her kind of like very simplistic start too. I love that idea. I also love what may feel boring, but just like a very simple overview slide. What is the size of the fund that you're raising? What, you know, what is your, um, the sector in which you're focused? Um, what, how many investments are you trying to make? What does a typical entry check size look like? Just frame it for me so I understand kind of your approach to the market. Talk to me about the market if it's one that's very nuanced, if it's something that's not very, you know, enterprise SaaS is one thing, but talking about uh, a, an angle around deep tech that might not be something that all LPs are familiar with. So spend some time there too. Um, and then I think the team is a natural next step because it's why are you, the, like, who are you and why are you the right one to do it? Um, so that flow to me feels very natural in many instances, but again, there's many different ways to approach it. Mm -hmm. One more question I'm going to ask on behalf of emerging managers who are solo GPs, can you speak to what that team side? I mean, I think kind of the same principles apply, but I imagine that LPs are going to ask, why are you doing this on your own? And so could you share a bit about any nuance for the solo GP? Uh, I'm happy to start. So for me, I think it's very much the same approach in many ways. So, you know, again, who are you? Why did you feel so compelled to do this? What is your background and why is it relevant? Um, you know, what are your differentiators and as an individual? Um, and then, you know, I think without having a team of general partners, I think it's critical to spend, and maybe it's on the same slide since it's all part of your quote unquote team is who are you leveraging? Who are you leveraging as your mm -hmm. outsource support? So, you know, highlight your fund administrator, highlight your outsource COO, if you have one, um, you know, highlight your law firm, both fund formation and deal attorney, if different. Your advisory um, board. If you mm -hmm. have an advisory board, you can highlight that. Um, the advisory board is a fascinating topic. Maybe we'll have to, to circle back yeah. and into. Um, but I would say put like highlight just the support structure you have thus far, knowing that it evolves, right? And if you're very early, not all of that's identified, but I would highlight as much of that as you can so that LPs reading your deck and say, oh, okay, yes, it is a solo GP, but there there is a lot of support around that individual if necessary. And, you know, I think that there are, depending on the LP you're speaking with, um, I think a lot of LPs are becoming increasingly very comfortable with the solo GP model. There's certainly others that aren't. So you'll have to, you know, talk about why you felt pursuing it as a solo GP strategy was the right decision for you as an individual. Um, but I, I do think it's becoming less of a, you know, bright light. It's like, oh boy, they're doing it by themselves. I, I think many are leaning into that. 
Yeah. And, and Sarah, I think just one thing I would add to that, um, you know, venture is just such a, a highly network relationship oriented business. And then, you know, as a solo GP, I think to the extent that you can, you know, highlight any call it networks and relationships that you're willing to share. So like, let's say you're a principal at your prior firm and now you're spinning off and starting your own. Like if you want to talk about, you know, different VCs that you've, you know, sat on boards with and that you've co-invested with and that just show that, that you have, you know, established networks in place that are really going to help be your, your source of, of deals, you know, as you build this by yourself, that I think will also help establish credibility as well. That's great. Thank you. I, so our next topic goes to the, how you establish credibility in a more detailed way. We're going to talk about track records and the track record slides, um, because there are many different ways to describe your performance. So, and many different types of track records that folks are going to be bringing to the table. So I'm going to share, um, some of the slides here. So we have, we're going to go through three versions. First is where the GP completely owns their track record. They have an angel track record that they're bringing um, to the table. And then the next two are going to be from a prior fund. Um, and so I want to talk about just as a topic first, what is, how do you display a track record when you completely own it? Um, and I'd like to ask for um, Katie, for you to start off and then others chime in. Um, but talk to us about, you know, here's your basic track record slide. Yeah. So I think, you know, anyone out there in this audience who may already be running their own fund, um, hopefully is very familiar with this template. You know, LPs just like to see the soup to nuts display of everything out there. And if you're you know, perhaps if you're not comfortable sharing specific company names and tying them to valuations, you can certainly anonymize this and keep a more uh, detailed or unveiled version for your data room. But, you know, you're putting it all out there. Here's like, you know, the companies you've invested in, the checks you've written, when they were, you know, sorry, when the deals were done, um, what the current last round fair market unrealized value is. And then the next column is obviously any distributions or exits that you've had. Um, this second to last column is TVPI, and then, sorry, the last column is is, is TVPI, so they'll, they'll want to see your multiples. Um, and so this is just a hypothetical angel investor. They have uh, a nice 1.6x track record they can go out and fundraise on. They've had uh, one nice 4x win uh, in, in Zen space, and these were all company names. We uh, brainstorm with chat GPT, so any um, any appearances, any real companies are completely coincidental and, and not <laughs> tied to reality there. Um, we've had another win in Green Grocer with a nice, uh, call it 1.3x. We've had one write down. Um, and so otherwise this is sorted chronologically. I've seen some people like to sort from, call it largest to smallest uh, by multiple. And, and there's, you know, different schools of thought around that. But this is just, you know, th the basic if you will, way that this information should be displayed and formatted. Any highlights or um, other thoughts here, Sarah or Ching, on this display of this track record? I think it's pretty standard and I, you know, so grateful that Katie and Jessica put this together. I mean, for a first time fund to have this template is golden. So congrats to uh, the NASDAQ folks and the IIEE people for hosting this thing. Um, wonderful. We're going to go into two other versions. This is when you are spinning out of a fund. Um, and I also do want to touch on if you're bringing a non-investment based track record, if you're not coming from a venture role. Um, but this is a second example. Um, and Katie, I'll ask you to lead, but this is from a GP who's coming from a prior firm and really is highlighting the companies that they were involved with. So I imagine mm -hmm. many of you in the audience are maybe in this position, um, thinking about how do you display your track record um, when you were part of a team, maybe not in a GP role. So um, Katie, lead us off. Yeah, and so this is, um, you know, call it a, a I don't wanna say watered down, but adapted example from a deck I've seen from a principal who was spinning out of an established fund to go off and launch their own. Um, you know, the, the caveat is that being a principal, they don't have legal attribution rights to claim the track record, but 
they do have call it you know a, a, a referenceable track record of companies that they were involved with whether it's deals they sourced whether it's boards they sat on um, if they're not comfortable sharing you know actual investment performance of these deals they have shown here that you know they were involved in these companies during a very strong period of, of revenue growth and so that's what they're trying to you know illustrate uh, with a slide like this and again showing their strength of network and sourcing um, to the extent that that's you know a, a powerful talking point for you certainly put that here um, but you know if you don't have an attributable track record even if you have investment experience there's a couple of different ways to be creative around this so this is just one example Right. I would add one thing that I actually um, encountered, which is um, not not at my previous firms, but I, I've heard through LPs that um, it's so important when you do something like this, where you're trying to show a track record from a different firm that you work with your previous firm to get buy in and make sure that your previous firm is going to say the same thing you're going to say. So if you say, I worked on this firm your previous firm better say the same thing because an LP <clears throat> will check. And the first, the, the easiest way to lose trust is if there is data conflicts, right? So you're like, I led an investment in Airbnb or I at least was on the, on the team that found Airbnb and I did the diligence on it, et cetera. And then they checked with the previous firm and they're like, no, so-and-so never touched Airbnb. So make sure you guys have your story state straight. Um, I've had GPs, for attribution's sake, actually have things in writing from their previous firm to say, what are you allowed and not allowed to say is yours? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, we have a question from Ben on the previous slide, which I'll go to. I think it's a good question. We actually discussed this, Katie and I, putting this together, um, which is the question of putting IRR or not. Um, Ben's question is, any reason for putting TVPI in over IRR, given that investments that emerging managers have a track record for are likely to be recent and multiple early in the J and multiple are early in their J curve. So IRR or not, um, would love thoughts from anyone. We did both. You did both. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there, there's no reason you can't add IRR, but just from my perspective, just in LP world, it's like, my favorite saying is like, you can't eat IRR. Like TVPI is just a cleaner calculation of dollars in dollars out. It takes the time out of the equation, which, you know, you can do funny things with dates that you decide to like mark things up or mark things down that can uh, massage IRRs a bit. And so, you know, TVPI is just, I think just a, a cleaner way of looking at this. I also think it's very hard to address. Like for example, if this was a GP's personal investment track record, um, IRR is a difficult thing. You don't have to manufacture in terms of capital in versus capital, but inflows are different than if you're working with a fund structure. So mm -hmm. you know, a lot of it will be situation dependent. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's something to deal with on a case by case basis. I think it's tough to say one way or the other one is always better. I mean, certainly if you look at, um, if it, if the LP in question is one that's trying to compare, across their asset classes, IRR is the way they do that. Um, so, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other, unfortunately. Yes. And Nisha has a, Nisha Desai, thank you for your question. Do you show the track record net of fees? As an LP, I love to see net numbers. Um, again, as if you're, if this is a personal track record, that's not relevant um, necessarily. But I, uh, if it is from a prior fund, I think net is great if you can. Agreed. Great. And if well, it's not, to... please tell me it's gross. Exactly. Don't and don't it. have both. Don't like have one that's net, one that's not. That's great advice. So be consistent. If, mm -hmm. And if you're showing net or gross, be clear. Mm -hmm. um, this is a third way of showing a track record. Um, this is also for someone spinning out of a fund. What's different about this um, in particular is that it's showing, you know, more, a little bit more of a nuanced detail about each company, including the co-investors. Um, and so I would say, you know, some elements of this, I think are really helpful. Like I, I like the co-investor 
um, column, but it's a little bit less clear maybe what the contribution of this person was. The last one was really focused on revenue. So um, I'm sure you all have seen a version of this before. Um, Ching, could you lead us off with any commentary on this version of a track record? Sure. I, I like this too. And, and to everyone's point, everyone tells the story differently. So whoever is telling the story, just pick what you're comfortable with. So if I was telling this story, I would actually not have the investors column there because it is a little busy. I would actually have a separate slide altogether on, you know, what is my syndication network? Who am I investing with? And that's a whole slide, right? So, because especially for emerging managers, LPs really care about who's in your network, who have you done deals with, who have you sourced from. And I would have beautiful logos of, you know, all these firms that I've worked with. So to, to me, again, as the storyteller, I would probably not use that um, column of investors. Interesting. One other thing I would consider um, here is if you're a multi-stage firm, I know this mentioned early stage generalists, but oftentimes you're following on in your best companies. I think it's important to have a separate column of any follow-on capital invested because that was often done at a later round, at a later valuation. I know it makes the numbers more complicated. Um, however, from an LP's perspective, we're gonna we're gonna want to understand where you're doubling down and why, and were those good bets or bad bets. And now it's very possible that all of detail is available in your data room, if it exists. I'm sure it is, um, but it's helpful to see um, if you are a multi-stage firm or if you're typically following on. Great. Are there any other questions about the track record slides? Our next session, we're going to talk about con portfolio construction and how you show that. But before we move on, any questions on track record or anything to share that you all have learned in the field fundraising? Track record is so important. And again, it, it, it speaks to your credibility. So don't, don't make mistakes, have a million people look at it. Also, don't be surprised when an LP digs deeper, you know, they, they're going to ask for an Excel spreadsheet. I, I want to see how you got to these numbers and they're going to want to um, make sure it's vetted. So again, if this is a long-term relationship and you've met them before, they're going to track. What did you tell me? was the multiple last time we met. So just be so careful. Again, don't don't do the 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 you know the silly mistake of making a mistake on numbers at this level. And and then one thing that is not even track record related and I'm sorry I'm jumping back. But one of the best piece of advice that I can give to people presenting to LPs is always start your presentation by asking the LPs to give them give you their intro. So have the LP tell you, what is their mandate? What is their focus? Because as you hear that, you can then tweak your delivery. So if your, your LP says, I really, really care about climate, of course you then highlight all the climate you know, advantages of your investments. If your LP says, I really think small funds are, are the, you know, the outliers in, in terms of giving great performance, Focus on how small you are and that you're consistently small. You're not going to be, you know, uh, he hearing the siren call of larger funds and changing your strategy. So always start with the LP telling you what they care about and then tweak your presentation accordingly. Great. Thank you, Ching. We're going to move on to portfolio construction and investment strategy. So how do you describe the details of um, your fund and your plans for investing capital? Um, we do have a couple of examples we'll go through. Um, so well, these are the two examples. So the first example is an overview of portfolio construction. I'm sure you all um, who have your decks already have some version of this. Um, this is a really simple overview showing how many investments you intend to make, um, average check size, target ownership, board seats, verticals. Um, Sarah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you're seeing portfolio construction displayed um, with Recast. You've looked at, I'm sure, hundreds, if not thousands of, of decks recently. Um, how does this kind of stack up to what you're seeing? 
Um, I think this is a great start. Visually, it's very simple. So I can see right out of the gate exactly what it is you're doing. Um, a few of the areas that I would consider perhaps highlighting differently would be your verticals of interest. I mean, I think that that's um, a huge part of your investment strategy. So highlighting that separately, I think would be um, a worthwhile effort. So here we mentioned consumer software, vertical SaaS, healthcare IT, and fintech. I would actually take those out, highlight them separately um, so we can understand why those areas of our, are of interest to you. Um, and do you mean separately, like those would each have their own slide? Um, it depends on, you know, what level of detail you're getting into and what kind of conversation you're having with your LP. But I would say at a minimum, you're, it's kind of a, a sub category of just talking about your investment areas um, and your kind of investment thesis. Why, you know, why are you investing, how you're investing? Talking about the core verticals would be kind of that earlier on discussion, I would imagine. Um, the only other thing that I think could also warrant, you know, uh, more focus, and this is maybe a, a nuance or said differently, a, a pet peeve of mine specifically. Um, when people talk about capital reserves for follow on, I really need to understand as an LP what your philosophy is around that. Where, did, how did you get that number for from twenty to thirty underlying estimates or underlying investments? Excuse me, an initial investment size. I mean, we all can do the math around why that makes sense for the fund size that we're talking about here. Um, but for capital reserves for follow on, um, there really needs to be a philosophy or um, a process that the GPs leverage in order to determine which companies receive follow on investment and which ones do not. And it's a it lends itself towards the discipline of the GPs. I mean, so so of course does number of investments and initial check size and ownership targets. Um, it's all kind of like, you told me you were going to do this and you execute that strategy, um, but tell me what you're doing with the follow-up. Why did you come to that number? Um, so I think that warrants more time and perhaps more space as well, maybe as a following slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's look at the next way of doing this, which is more um, text heavy, but does describe um a little bit more the the approach for follow on. So I think this slide, this is our basic example. I'm sure you all could design it in a way that looks a little bit better. But as a basic example, um, getting to your point, Sarah, describing the approach, um, would you recommend having you know this level of text in a slide, or is this better for a data room? I think that's my question. Looking at the different ways we can have portfolio construction described? I mean, I would much prefer it the other way. This to me is a eyesore. It's very difficult to get through quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the other way gets you what you, what you need quite quickly. In fact, this is a really lovely just overview slide in general. I mean, if you had this early on, mm -hmm. it's also a description of uh, or, um, including the fund size itself. I mean, this kind of gets you a, a, in a quick view, everything that we're talking about here. Uh, which is helpful to level set. So I actually, I prefer the simplicity and then we can dig into investment areas, why ownership of that size, why this number of companies, why this follow on in, in the following slide. That's, but that's one opinion, so. I agree. I, I also like this and, and to Sarah's point, you know, we, we want to dig in deeper to the capital reserves as well as the verticals. But what's beautiful about this is like this dashboard, a, a, a guideline for P, the LPs to know what's coming. And so it's almost like, okay, we're gonna show you all of this and let's double click on capital reserves. And then you have another slide on capital reserves using maybe the same icon. So then the LP is like, oh, I get it. You're double clicking on that. And then verticals, you're using the same icon. You're, you're talking about verticals now. To the other slide that you you pointed to, Jessica, with a lot of text, mm -hmm. it, that's also really nice. Now, now, meaning if your objective is to give them something, a leave behind, where they don't have to remember everything, your voiceover to the slides, because this could be in your appendix. So this is just to, so that you don't have to take so many notes while we were talking. This is a summary in the appendix slide. Mm, interesting. Maybe yeah, I, I guess... Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, one thing I would I would add to that is that I think we need to think about investment strategy and portfolio construction as two related but separate things. Um, so investment strategy, 
that's where you can take, you know, three, four, five slides to really, really well define your investment thesis, your worldview, the sandbox that you're playing in, the problem problems that you're trying to solve, whether that's with like market data and kind of where the world is today, where we think it's heading, and here's how we're going to you know, invest and capitalize on that. And then the portfolio structure is going to be like the tactical, here's how we're going to do that nuts to bolts, like by deploying, you know, X number of checks between X and Y amount. And then this is, you know, our call it follow on strategy. So we can sort of underwrite what return level we're trying to hit. So I would, I guess I would think of it, this is like two separate sections and this slide, this dashboard slide is great because it gives a nice high level dashboard where someone can tell they're interested in learning more or not, then great, like double click, keep reading. Um, but you know, if, if you're not interested in FinTech or consumer software or vertical SaaS, like you've got on the seventh box, then maybe we're not for you. And you can kind of make that, you know, quickly and move on if this comes into your email or whatever. So. Great. Um, any questions from the audience on portfolio construction or investment strategy? Okay, we're going to move on to um, fund terms and what you should be thinking about um, when talking about your fund terms at a high level. Um, we mean, what is your fee, your investment period, close date, but really what should be on this fund term slide? What should you do reserve? Is there anything that you should hold back? Um, Ching, would you lead us off on what is a great fund term slide? I'm very jealous of this manager. They the initial close was September, and then two months later they had a final. <laughs> they call. were on a roll. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, what are they selling? I want some. Um, I think this is again very standard. I, I like it a lot. Um, actually, I learned something from this slide. I previously would not have added the council, the fund administrator, or the or the uh, auditor at this level. That's usually in the ODD, you know, when, when the operations, you know, folks come in. But I like having that upfront, especially for emerging managers, right? So I, I haven't had the, um, the pleasure of working with emerging managers in my career. I've, I've worked with established managers. And so I can understand why this is so important. Because for those council and those administrators and those um, fund administrators and auditors to even take you on, that's another level of, you know, credibility and safety in their mind. So I like the slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to the point of an emerging manager slide and how it might differ, um, Sarah, are you, does this kind of align with what you're seeing um, LPs respond to with emerging managers? Is there anything you would add? Yeah. I think, you know, the I, GP commitment in particular is one I think emerging managers are thinking a lot about. Yeah, so I, I um, just to touch on the prior comment, absolutely as an emerging manager, I think highlighting uh, your your fund formation attorney, fund administrator, auditor, if you have any other outsourced support, I actually think it's fantastic to highlight it here. Again, even if you told them previously on a team slide, because again, it, it does talk about the scaffolding around you. It makes you appear uh, more institutional. So I think that's a really, a very strong, um, uh, good use of space on this slide. I, you know, we can go back and forth on whether or not to put a final close date on there or not, because we all know in a market, particularly like ours, people are leveraging their extensions constantly, right? Like you may have, your docs may say you have 12 months um, to raise the fund, but there's always that option for a six month extension or more, depending on how, you know, your LP's level of, of um, flexibility and whatnot. So I would be hesitant putting a final close date on there unless you were getting very close to it and it was a hard line in the sand and you wanted to use that to manufacture urgency. Um, but that's one opinion. And then, yes, yeah, I think minimum investment is a nice thing to be able to showcase. I think for many, um, I will see two numbers. It's a, a minimum investment size for an individual or a family office versus a minimum investment mm -hmm. size for a institution. Um, and so feel free to have a larger number for institutions there. Um, and they can always be, you know, it doesn't have to be a hard line in the sand either. If you feel the need to be more flexible in certain instances, like, you know, you can certainly change that. The GP commit is such a hot button issue, um, and a, a significant sticking point for me as an LP, particularly an LP focused on emerging managers. 
I think, you know, the traditional thought around GP commit is, you know, that standard um, 1% that, uh, you know, shows quote unquote skin in the game from the LP perspective, you know, for an emerging manager that is not independently wealthy, the skin in the game is the reputation, your reputation, right? You're building something that if it doesn't go well, your career is impacted. Your reputation is impacted. It's not just your um, not just your personal, like financial livelihood on the line. Um, and so I think it's, it's too simplistic to say, oh, well, it must be 1% across the board. Um, I, I do not think you need to have it on a fun term slide, uh, particularly if you're taking a more non-traditional, I say that in big quotations, um, I don't want to dissuade anyone from doing something different than 1%. If, if that is a significant financial burden for you, consider it, talk to advisors about that. It is, it is okay to do something that is not the standard 1%. Um, the only flip side of that I will give is if you are a founder who exited a company for gobs of money, you're extremely independently wealthy, I better see a GP commit that's a heck of a lot higher than 1%. Because this is not, you know, you're building, again, it's your reputation, it's your financial livelihood, but you're in a very different financial position than others are. And so to show that quote unquote skin on the game, it's not, okay, I'm very independently wealthy. Um, my incentives are not aligned with my LPs at all because if this fund doesn't work out, it doesn't really impact me that much, right? Um, and I don't really, the long-term carry is not the incentive I need. And in fact, the, the short-term fee is not really the incentive that I need either. Um, so it does cut both ways. But mm -hmm. um, so if you find yourself in a position to be able to leverage a GP commit that's significantly higher than one would expect, I would absolutely showcase that because I think LPs will be excited about that level of alignment. Um, but I do not think just in any other quote unquote, you know, traditional emerging manager embarking on their fundraising strategy that you need to showcase it. Interesting. Thank you. That's really insightful, Sarah, um, about the different ways that you could approach it. Um, Katie, anything you want to add on our fun term slide? Yeah. So no, I mean, to piggyback off what Sarah said, you know, I, I feel like sometimes VC gets a bad rap as a retirement job for very successful <laughs> exited founders. And so to overcome that, you absolutely, you again, need to go to the other end of the spectrum and really be putting in a substantial uh, GP commit. Um, you know, I guess I'm going to respectfully disagree. I, I do think it is helpful to keep this as a line item in there, no matter where you are kind of in your personal circumstances, um, even if it's, you know, again, as small as 1%, there's ways to, to do that through management fee deferrals and the like. This isn't necessarily meaning you're coughing up this amount of cash out of your pocket um, from day one, but it just shows that, that you are aligned with your LPs and you're not just doing this to raise a fund and collect fees for the fund term and then, you know, what maybe, maybe. Um, you know, let me think about what else on this. Mm. Yeah, you know, I guess the last piece, sometimes the question comes up on high watermarks. Um, this is something you probably don't see as much of in venture, but this is, you know, very common in more private equity or, or hedge fund strategies. And, you know, depending on, I guess, where we are in this very capital constrained environment, if LPs are going to want to expect to see, you know, a high watermark again to ensure that that you're meeting sufficient you know, call it returns before you're able to take any carry um, is definitely something I think that's going to merit conversation in this fundraising cycle and beyond. Great. Thank you. Um, I do want to, I'll ask a question for the audience. Um, can we talk about management fees and what we're seeing as market? Is 2% still market? Are you seeing higher um, for emerging managers, yeah. are you seeing lower? What, or, what is or, let's say, or like a step down for, you know, like invest, like, I guess after the investment period's over, you know, is there a step down there? Are you charging just a flat 2% throughout the life of the fund? Um, maybe Sarah would have more view on that as a emerging manager LP. Yeah, I think we're seeing more often two and a half percent, particularly on fund sizes of a hundred. Um, I think many LPs, understand that to make the economics work just in running the business and building a team, you need a little bit more juice. Um, but with the understanding that that steps down, you know, over time after the investment period, 
Uh, I think on average, you're starting to see that, you know, it, it hits 2% and then, you know, the um, gradually over time then dips below that as well. Um, with the idea of course, being that as you raise a subsequent fund with the additional two and a half percent or 2%, whatever the case may be, like you end up kind of stacking those fees for the management company. So it feels more level over time rather than these big cliffs and, and roller coaster. But I think two and a half out of the gate for the investment period is what we're seeing more often than not. That's my experience too. And, and like, to your point, the very first fund we raised for one of the firms I worked with was 2.5. And mm -hmm. then as fund two, fund three, fund four, there was negotiations that made it more normalized to the closer to the 2%. So I think LPs are very understanding. You need those fees to help you kick off something. Um, so I haven't heard any pushback on that. Okay, great, great. Um, our last question before we go to breakout rooms, which um, I'm looking forward to you all having the breakout rooms to get to know one another and also our speakers a little bit better. Um, this actually came from one of our attendees and this is not about the deck, but related, which is about a website. Do you need to have a website for your firm? And if so, what should be on it? Should it mimic the deck in any way? What what have you all seen and what should managers be investing in in terms of a web presence? I can go. Great. Um, so before I, I started uh, fundraising for VC firms, I was the partner of marketing. And before being partner of marketing at these VC firms, I was um, director of marketing in a whole bunch of tech startups. And before that, I worked with big tech companies like Sun Microsystems and Informix, all in the world of marketing. So I'm telling you this so you know I'm biased towards marketing. And as you know, LPs, as they're looking into you, they're going to Google you. They're going to look up your website. So your story, your core messaging have to align. And you're saying the same thing, but differently because your website should be geared towards your ultimate audience, which is startups, people you're trying to attract into your fold. So of course, the secondary audience is LPs and LPs know that. So when you're writing your website, it should be geared towards your ultimate customer and they wanna hear your voice and how you speak to these customers. Um, so I would definitely have a website. And I say that as if it's so easy because if, especially if you're a solo GP, emerging manager, how are you gonna find time? to create a website. It could be very bare bones. It could be five pages, um, but make sure that it's the same branding, you know, so the same look and feel as the, the investor deck that you're going to use with LPs. You're using the same messaging. If you're harping on your domain expertise, that should come out obviously in your website as well as your deck. So the same family of messages, but it's a different audience. I hope that makes sense. Great. I've yeah, even... I, I, Oh, go ahead. Oh, Kate. sorry. No, I was just saying, I think the website's a really great platform to show off, you know, again, the website is not a solicitation document, but it's a, again, a, a bigger way to build your brand. So the extent that you've got, you know, different pieces of, uh, you know, call it like thought collateral. So that's where you show off your blog posts, your podcast, your media appearances. Um, you can put more detailed bios of all of your team members. And that's obviously something, obviously something that should, you know, go, in your deck to some degree and also to the data room, but it's, it's, you know, your website, you've got, you know, call it free reign. Like you can't go out and say like we're soliciting for a fund, but it should be a very good picture of here's who we are. Here's what we do. Here's what we're all about. Um, again, obviously with the main objective of attracting founders, but, you know, we call it the secondary objective of, you know, making sure LPs see a, a, a message that's inviting and consistent with, with what they see in your deck. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it, this, um, if possible to do as Ching and, and Katie have described, I think that's fantastic. At a very bare minimum, having a landing page that just is associated with the firm, that ties to your email address if possible, that um, has a way to contact you, even if it's at hello at recastcapital.com, whatever the case may be, so that people can reach you through that medium. So it, it it's it's real. Right. I mm -hmm. think for um, even emerging managers that are just embarking on a fundraising process or even maybe pre first close, um, it's 
it's a almost a vote of confidence. It, it makes the LPs feel like it, there's a little bit more there. Um, even if it is so early, just a simple landing page can make a really big difference. Um, I can't tell you the amount of folks we've had come through that, that hadn't had a, a presence at all yet. And it just, it feels so early that it can be really tough for some LPs to feel comfortable leaning in. I mean, not, not true for us. We're happy to lean in whenever, but I think it, that's certainly the reactions that we've heard folks have. Uh, so something to consider. Mm -hmm. And sorry, what, one more thought to add to that. I know we're already cutting into the breakout time, but you know, website as part of a call it web presence completely. So I'm thinking of LinkedIn, you know, to make sure that your profile is consistent, that you have a placeholder firm page with, you know, from an aesthetic standpoint, that's all tied to the same brand identity. And, and even if you have, you know, your like two or three sentence about us, that's, that's on LinkedIn, that's all going to be, you know, supporting the story that your investors will see out there. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, yes. And I, I will say I've seen more and more emerging managers leveraging things like notion as their, you know, web presence. And I think that that can be fine. It can be very simple. As long as you have a link that's discoverable. Um, I don't think it needs to be fancy or um, a big task, but I, I fully agree. I think having a website does make sense. Wonderful. Well, we are going to conclude this panel. Thank you. We're going to go into breakout rooms. We've been recording this session so that you all can have it later, but I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, and